Good stuff. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. We began preaching through Sunday night, the book of Ephesians. And some things about Ephesians that's really important to us has to do with, <coughs> excuse me, the high ground that we find ourselves in. In other words, Ephesians deals with some very deep doctrine, but yet again, it's also very, very practical. Now here in Ephesians chapter number 1, he deals with the church as a body. And really when you break down the first part of the chapter, verses 1 through 6, it talks about the plan of the Father. Verses 7 through 12, the purchase by the Son. And then verses 13 and 14, the preservation by the Spirit. So that's a good outline with the Trinity being involved. Aren't you glad every part of God is involved in your salvation? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so that's very interesting about this passage. And also, when you break down chapter number 1, our adoption is seen. We preached about that a little bit last time. Verses 4 and 5, we're adopted. And then verse number 6, we're accepted. Verse number 7, I'll be preaching about tonight, we're acquired. We've been purchased. Verse number 7, also, we've been absolved from our sins. He talks about abounding in verses 8 through 12. Lord willing, I'll preach on that Sunday night. Verses 13 and 14, we've been anointed. And also, verses 13 and 14, we've been assured. So these things are very um, plain and, and, and clear here in chapter number 1. So tonight we're going to look in verse number 7. He says, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace." And we talked about being accepted with God last week. God has done all these amazing things for us. He's predestinated us. And of course, predestination has to do with those who are saved. We covered that. But notice here in verse number 7, the basis of our acceptance with God is the fact that we have been redeemed. So I want to preach on being redeemed tonight. Verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the privilege of being in church. Thank You for the songs we were able to sing and hear. Lord, what a blessing to hear the melody of music once again. And God, I pray that You might resonate those songs and hymns and spiritual songs in our hearts throughout the week. We pray the Word of God may dwell richly in our hearts as well tonight, that You might speak to us with this book. Thank You for the words of life. From the Bible, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. To begin, I want you to look in verse number 7, the first two words, look at that. The first two words, in whom. When you back it up, obviously it's talking about Jesus Christ, because it says in verse number 4, according as He hath chosen us in Him. And I talked some last week about the theme of Colossians, about us being in Christ. And the idea is when you trust Jesus as your Savior, you are baptized into the body of Christ. That's called spiritual baptism. If you've ever heard someone use the term the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's what that means. That means you have been baptized spiritually. Jesus Christ's body is not here physically, but yet Jesus' body is, exists spiritually. You say, I don't understand it. I don't either. That's why it's called a mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory in Colossians. It's a mystery. That you're part of Him and He's part of you. But really when you think about the glory of that is, that means that you have been joined to Him and you're safe and you're saved, you're preserved, and you're kept. And so I'm in Christ. So the first two words in verse number 7, when we talk about redemption, in whom? So when we talk about those who are redeemed, those who are redeemed are the ones that are saved. Somebody outside of Christ is not redeemed. Um, I can make statements about people that are here tonight. I could say, okay, if you're here tonight, then you're going to get a free hot dog. And you're like, I don't want a hot dog. Well, free cotton candy then. All right. I saw kids smile and light up. But the people that aren't here, too bad. So sad. People that are in Christ have been redeemed. 
So Jesus Christ died for everybody, but that doesn't automatically mean everybody's saved. You've got to get in Christ, and you get in Christ by receiving Christ as your personal Savior. That's pretty clear. So the participants of redemption, clearly those who are in Christ. Notice the purchasing of redemption here. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now let's define what redemption is. This is one of those theological words. And this is why, you know, people don't like to preach this way anymore because it's Bible words. And when you deal with Bible words, you actually have to learn things. I was reading a little book uh, this week and the, the old time preacher said this. He said, uh, you know, God actually expected first century Christians to read the book of Hebrews and to read 1 John and to read Matthew. They were not nearly as educated as you are. Well, I just don't understand. You can read, can't you? <laughs> God expects us to step up to the plate and say, okay, what does the Bible say about redemption? What does the Bible say about justification? What does the Bible say about propitiation? What, is, what does the Bible say about sanctification? You'll notice a lot of those words end in I-O-N. And you keep running those references and you begin to see these words. So let's define redemption. And we'll go back to the Old Testament first. Go to Exodus chapter 6. And let's understand the context of redemption. The term itself is used in purchasing something back or rescuing someone out of bondage. And the language, language is used oftentimes in the Old Testament for redeeming a slave, for rescuing or delivering someone out of the bondage of slavery, to be set free. Notice here in Exodus chapter 6, it's used in reference to the nation of Israel. And of course you know that they went down into Egypt, Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob, the patriarchs, go down into Egypt and they don't stay in the promised land and sojourn in the promised land. They wind up into Egypt. Then they become a mighty nation. You have about 430 years that pass since Abraham and they become a great and mighty nation. And God says, okay, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. That is called the Exodus, but it's also referred to as the redemption of Israel. One thing that's interesting to note about that, we won't turn to it, but remember when Israel came out of Egypt? That night that they were delivered out of Egypt is called Passover. And that began the, the first of their year from that point on. And they were redeemed out of Egypt by the blood of a lamb. It's very important in typology. Because you were redeemed out of this world by the blood of the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 6, look at it here in verse number 4. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept keep in bondage. And I remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will, here it is, redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment. Come over to Psalm 103 and notice in the Old Testament, redemption not only refers to a historical thing that took place with Israel, but the, the word is also used devotionally, dealing with redemption from all kind of things. It's kind of like we use the word save. Obviously, theologically, we'll talk about, yeah, I was saved. And you're pointing back to a conversion experience. You're pointing back in your life to a time when you made a decision to receive Christ. You say, I was saved. But you know, God saves you from all kind of things. Has God not saved you from some of the headaches in the world because you followed Him? Has God not saved you from some troubles and trials as a result of sin because He saved you out of sin? So you can use that in a devotional sense as well, and so does the Bible here with redemption. Look in Psalm 103. Psalm 103, my life psalm. People say, what's your favorite verse? Well, I don't have a favorite verse. I have a favorite chapter. Psalm 103. Look down, if you will, in verse number 4. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. So you see that it's more than just Okay, I have a point in life as a nation that I can look back and say, my people were delivered out of Egypt. This is a personal thing where the psalmist can say, he's redeemed me personally. 
and I can look in things in my life and say he's redeemed me from some destruction. So redemption has to do with purchasing. It has to do with buying something back. To redeem something, if you go down to the pawn shop, you buy the thing back after you put it in. Of course, you've got to pay some more money probably to get the thing back, but you're purchasing something you used to have. Think of it in this context. Remember Adam and Eve? They had fellowship with God, but then they lost fellowship with God. In one sense, God lost Adam. So how do you know? Because he went looking for him. <laughs> he said, hey, Adam, where are you? Um, of course, God always knew where Adam was. Adam just didn't know where Adam was. That's why I asked him the question, where art thou? But anyway... That communion, communion and fellowship was lost and there was a disconnect that had to be reconnected. And so redemption is God buying back, when you think about it in the scope of humanity, purchasing humanity that he originally had already had because he originally created Adam in his own image. And of course Adam sinned and then Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty so men could again have fellowship with God. Now the parallel of redemption is a word that we don't use a lot in the Bible. Come over to the book of Jeremiah chapter 31. Is it okay that we have a Bible study tonight? I'm glad you brought your Bibles. We don't have a screen to put it on. So uh, it's a good thing we have a Bible. I guess in the next generation you're going to have to start teach, teach kids. You've got to say this is a book. No one else around you will ever use a book. I didn't say nook, I said book. These are pages. It's actually pieces of wood. All right, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. Look down, if you will, in verse number 11. And here's a word that's comparable, a parallel, if you will, of redemption. And it helps explain things a little better. Verse number 11, For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Okay, so redeemed is used and then ransomed is used. So ransom is a little different than redemption, yet it's used hand in hand with redemption. To ransom something is to secure a release by the payment of a price which is real similar to what we've been saying about redeeming something by purchasing it. But ransom kind of gives you that little bit more of an understanding of a payment having to be made. If you ransom someone, you know, you have some uh, rich family billionaires and all of a sudden their, their little, uh, little uh, daughter or son comes up missing and next thing you know there's a ransom note on the mailbox. It says, we got little Julie and if you don't give us $100 million... We'll send you her skin in, in the mail tomorrow, or whatever the, the gory details are. But a ransom is to pay a price to set someone free, to be delivered by the payment of a ransom. So when you talk about redemption, it presupposes some type of bondage, but it's not a bondage that is um, infinite. It's not a bondage, it's not like somebody's in bondage without any hope. You, and I've never done any. I guess I just never have done, never have put anything in a pawn shop. But I guess when you go put the thing in the pawn shop, there's hope that you could come back and get it out. I guess if you get it before the allotted time or however that works. So here's man's, here's God's creation in bondage. And man thinks, well, it's all over now. I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I'm without hope. And I've got not only my own sin, I've got the devil breathing around my neck. And God says, you're not without hope because I can redeem you and there's a price that can be paid to set you free. Matthew 20, you don't have to turn there. Verse number 28, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom. So sometimes when you hear us talk about Jesus paying the price, that's what we're talking about. Jesus, his very life was laid down as a ransom for our redemption. I know this is real basic stuff. Just soak it in. He hung on the cross and he cried, It is finished, which is the same, the same words that someone would use in a retail market to say your account is paid in full. That's that same word. A payment was made on Calvary's cross that satisfied the price of redemption. 
The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.6, He gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Turn over to um, 1 Peter chapter 1 in one hand and then flip over to Revelation 5 in the other. We'll look at 1 Peter 1 first and then Revelation 5. 1 Peter chapter 1. So when we speak about Jesus laying down His life, it's more than just Him laying down His life and dying. He did not die as a martyr. A lot of people mistakenly assume that Jesus Christ was martyred and then he started a religion because he was martyred. That's nowhere near the idea of Christianity at all. Uh, Jesus Christ laid down his life as a sacrifice. There's a difference in a sacrifice and someone being martyred. Jesus Christ was a propitiatory sacrifice. A propitiation means it's a sacrifice that satisfied the demands. And before your mind gets to going crazy... He didn't satisfy the demands of the devil. He satisfied the demands of God. Now, the devil's a bad guy. And the devil obviously had a big part to play in our demise. There's a connection between sin and Satan and that serpent. I understand that. But the devil did not get paid off by God to let you free. You might have been bond slave to sin and also a slave to the devil, but the devil hadn't been paid off. The devil does not want Jesus' blood. God demanded the satisfactory sacrifice of the blood of his son. First Peter chapter number one, look at it, verse number eighteen. For as much as you know you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Notice verse 18, corruptible things can't redeem you. It's sad when you think about religion, organized religion. They have rituals, they have ceremonies. A lot of times they have holy water that they think if you sprinkle the holy water on you, it, it will help you. They eat the bread, they drink the juice, and they think by eating the physical bread, drinking the physical juice, that it's going to give them spiritual life. That's sad. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is what redeems you. It's not some ordinance that man comes up with. Notice also in Revelation chapter 5, we have these 24 elders, which are a great type picture of the church. And it seems to indicate in Scripture they do represent the church, because they're out of all nations. But notice Revelation chapter 5, verse number 9, Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and the open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So notice the price of redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the price. So back over here in, in our text in Ephesians chapter number 1. In Ephesians chapter number 1. She's like, help me. I can't help you. I'm sorry. I used to say that to my daddy when he would get ready to put a good one on me. No, 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 no. Put your hands on the bed. <laughs> And the bad thing is, the closer you get, it just wraps around and winds. If you're wearing shorts as a little kid, man, it winds up getting on your legs. And he had one of those belts that had all these little holes in it. So as it went through the air, man, it just it did, the air didn't stop at any. It was just whoosh. Oh, man. Ephesians chapter number 1. I always root for the kid. <laughs> I root for the kid. <laughs> All right, I'm a kid at heart. Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at it in verse number 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now that's very important because when you read the parallel passage in Colossians, it says almost the same thing. In Colossians it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. But in Colossians 1.14, the new Bible versions remove the phrase through his blood. And of course, one of their excuses is, well, you can find it in Ephesians. Well, I don't need Mark, Luke, and John. Then I'm just going to cut those out because I can find it in Matthew. Now, it's really kind of a, a pretty lame argument. But what I want us to see here about redemption here is there's a connection in verse number 7 with redemption and forgiveness. Now, go back to the Old Testament again. Go back to 
Numbers chapter 14 and Exodus 34. Numbers chapter 13 and Exodus 34. And what you want to understand back in the Old Testament, God did forgive people. And thank God, forgiveness is all through the Bible. Some people say, well, we're in the age of grace, and this is the only time God shows grace. God has shown grace all through the Bible. He showed grace to Noah. He showed grace to Abraham. You ever think about Joshua and them after they come out and they cross over and uh, they come over to Gilgal after they cross Jordan? And before they go into Jericho, God says, before y'all can take the sword and use it on anybody else, you've got to use it on yourself. All these years, y'all haven't been circumcising your boys. Get the sword out and let's get on this hill and start circumcising. God had grace. They had rejected the covenant under Abraham. He said you're supposed to circumcise. You can go through the Bible and find grace, grace, grace all over there. And God forgave people all through the Bible. Think about David for just a minute. And David, we know, is an exception because God uses him to show us some things. The sure mercies of David is called. But David committed murder and adultery, and neither one of those sins back in Old Testament legal days had a satisfactory sacrifice to offer forgiveness from God with. Neither one of them. I can imagine David within that nine-month period before his sin got found out how many people he had to, had to come in front of him, and he had to say guilty of adultery and send them off to, to die. We say, man, you preachers, y'all too strict. Go back to the Old Testament. You talk about strict, talk to God for just a little while. Guy picks up sticks on the Sabbath day. Moses says, Lord, what should we do? God says, kill him. Uh, man and his wife are in the garden and they eat some fruit they're not supposed to eat. And God says, I just think you're just a little bit hard. Uh, read the Bible. B-I-B-U-L, Bible. All right, look over here. So God did forgive in the Old Testament. God is the same, same yesterday and day and forever. God's nature is always the same. You've got to understand that. But when you go through the Bible, you'll see, and when you study the Bible as far as His covenants and dispensations, God works differently. For instance, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but the Bible says Noah was righteous before God, and Noah feared God. What, what did he do? Did he trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith? Noah didn't know anything about Jesus Christ. He knew God said, if you don't get on that boat, you're going to drown like the rest of them. So he got out there and he built a huge vessel. That was Noah's righteousness. But God was very merciful to let Noah do that. Now, look over here in Exodus chapter 34, verse number 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. So when you teach theology, attributes of God, that's a good place to start. The first thing about God that Moses said, he says he's merciful, then he's gracious, then he's long-suffering, then he's abundant in goodness and truth. Verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands. Look at this. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But here's the key. And that will by no means clear the guilty. There's no clearing of that sin. It's the same thing that you see over here in Numbers chapter 14. Verse number 18 is really the same passage. We don't have to reread it. Here's what you want to understand in the Old Testament when we talk about redemption. Israel as a nation was redeemed out of Egypt. That has to do with the historical nature of redemption. As individuals... Under the Mosaic law, they could be forgiven, but their sins were not cleared out. Come over to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9. Now, do you remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and God saw them with their fig leaves? He understood that wouldn't work, so God took an animal, he killed it, probably a lamb, and he made skins to clothe them. So they're walking around, and they got their leather skins on, and God had made that animal sacrifice to cover them. Consequently, when Cain and Abel get ready to approach unto God, somehow somebody has told Abel to bring a lamb. And he brings that lamb on the altar. And God, fire comes down from heaven. That happens about seven times in your Bible where fire comes down. I think seven. I'll have to go. Don't quote me on that. But fire comes down from heaven and consumes that sacrifice. So how do you know? Because how else would Abel know that God was pleased with it? 
Abel, Cain gets over there, chops up the turnips, tries to find blood in the, turn, the turnip, and nothing happens. That principle of animal blood sacrifice, you see it through the patriarchs. Even Noah, when he gets off the ark, what does he do? Immediately he offers the clean animals as a sacrifice. He knows if I'm going to approach to God, I better bring blood. You say, oh, I'm gonna, I, I can be saved. I don't have to have Jesus. I don't have to have his blood. You know, that's just kind of archaic. I don't believe in seeing all them old hymns about all that blood, having those Bible stories with all that blood, talk about Jesus' blood. I'll get me a bloodless Bible. I'll get me a bloodless hymn book. You won't approach unto God without his blood. Amen. Unless you have Jesus' blood, you'll bust hell wide open. And that's what religion needs to hear today because religion out in the world and all these supposed Christian religions are bloodless. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. You cut every single human, I don't care what race they are, where they came from, they bleed. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus' blood is God's blood. Acts 20 verse 28 and that's the satisfactory price. Now notice here in Hebrews chapter number 9. So let's get in our mindset back here to the Old Testament here. And we know that back in the Old Testament they're offering all these sacrifices. Hebrews chapter 9. Look down if you will. Verse number 22. Hebrews 9, 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. You remember when Moses had those, that commandment and he wrote it in the book? The Bible says he sprinkled the book with the blood. Remember when he set up the tabernacle, he went in and they sprinkled the Holy of Holies with blood. So in verse 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now keep reading in Hebrews and come over to chapter 10 real quick. In chapter number 10, he's talking about the priesthood and how that every year, notice in verse number 1, Verse number 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now specifically what he's talking about, um, Leviticus 16, is the... Day of Atonement. Now, obviously, we know how. Let's just be honest. Do you think Jews, every time they heard somebody swearing, they went and traveled maybe 50, 100, 200, 400 miles to go sacrifice because they heard somebody cussing? I doubt everybody did all the sacrifices they should have done. There were sacrifices of peace offerings. There were sacrifices of transgression. Uh, there was all kind of... When a woman uh, had a baby, there were certain sacrifices she was supposed to bring, just like Mary did. When she had Christ, she brought the little pigeons and turtle doves and so forth as a sacrifice of sin offering. All types of sacrifice when you read there. They didn't do everything they were supposed to do, I guarantee it. But once a year, the high priest would go in the holy place, the holy of holies rather, the place that nobody was ever supposed to go except that one time of year in September. And he would put the blood on the mercy seat and God would be satisfied and the nation would be, quote unquote, forgiven as a group. And so we see here that if that sacrifice was good enough, they wouldn't have to do it every year. But they're going back constantly, constantly, constantly. Can you imagine, uh, let's just say you owed somebody 20 bucks, and you went and said, hey, man, I, I forgot, I'm, I'm going to get you $20 next week. The guy said, you know what, I'd rather you just have it as a gift. Uh, I forgive the debt. Don't worry about the 20 bucks. Then you run into him two days, he says, where's my 20 bucks? What's up, man? You'd be like, you got Alzheimer's or something? You told me you forget. Don't be telling me that, man. Give me the 20 bucks. Then you get talking to this, all right, all right, man, I, I'll just for, You don't owe me the $20. I just forgive the debt. Then you see him three days later, he's like, hey, man, where's my 20 bucks? <laughs> That's how it was. Every year they had to go back. It never did clear them out. It never did cancel it out. Repetition, it's like, this is not working. Look in verse number 4. Why did it not work? Even though they brought blood, why did it not work? Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. That word we read back in Exodus about being cleared is like being taken away. 
you clear something up, you, you take it up, you take it away. So the saints, they had their sins forgiven, but they didn't have them taken away. Think of it this way. You go into, uh, you go to Best Buy and say, I want that, you know, that TV that's long as a football field. I don't know why you would want a TV big as a football field, but people do. Uh, you walk in some people's house, and instead of having a wall, they have a TV. <laughs> anyway, you go in and say, hey, I want, this, I want this TV, and they say it costs, you know, $5,500. So, okay, no problem. And you pull out a credit card. And you get a TV, and they load it up, and you bring it home. Or you get a tractor trailer and load it up and bring it home. <laughs> and you tell your neighbor, say, yeah, man, I just bought this, I just purchased this new TV. You just lied to your neighbor because you ain't purchased nothing. You bought it on credit. You just signed your life away to someone other than the place you brought the item from and you gave them an IOU. But you have not purchased it. Not until you pay 25% interest or whatever they're going to gouge you for so you can walk in your room and see a TV instead of a wall. So the idea is that the Old Testament saints were forgiven, but they were forgiven on credit. In other words, it was an IOU that the blood of bulls and goats, I'm going to forgive you, but the blood of bulls and goats is not the satisfactory sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats anticipates the Lamb of God, which will take away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29, there's that word, similar word to being cleared, to being taken away. John says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ fulfilled the debt. You're in Hebrews still. Go back to chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9, and look down in verse number 15. Hebrews 9, verse number 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Now we all know, I think we're Bible students enough to know when we take your Bible and you get to Malachi and you get to Matthew, you see there's a difference here. One of them says Old Testament, one says New Testament. Some of the old timers used to call it the Old Bible and the New Bible. Um, but it's called the Old Testament and the New Testament. So generally speaking, we understand Old Testament. We think about Moses. We think about law. We think about deeds. New Testament, we think about Jesus. We think about grace. We think about faith. That's a good Simple break. Here we see that you had transgressions in the Old Testament. They might have been forgiven as we see back in the Old Testament. But notice, his blood had to be shed for the redemption of those transgressions as well. Hebrews 9, 15. So there's a connection between being redeemed and being forgiven. I really said all that to say this. When you think about the Old Testament people, just in that sense, okay, they're forgiven, but then their forgiveness really doesn't have any, any uh, authority to it until Jesus Christ sheds his blood. Let's just say the same thing about you and me. You being forgiven by God has no authority whatsoever unless you have the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on you. Now do you understand when I say one of the sins of the South, as far as the churches are, is when they say, you want to be saved, just ask God to forgive you of your sins. Because they do that with no blood. They're not coming to God saying, hey, I know your blood was shed for me. I know you died on the cross for my sins. I know you died in my place. Now I'm asking you to forgive me based on that. They're just coming saying, Lord, I really messed up. Will you forgive me so I can go to heaven? They don't even understand redemption. Now, I'm not saying you've got to understand all the details about redemption, but that's one of the sins of the South is every night before people go to bed, they, they've heard the, the preachers go through the little prayer all the time, so they say, I'm going to do this you know, just for security in case I die in my sleep. Lord, please forgive me for all my sins. God can't let anybody into heaven just because they said, God, please forgive me for all my sins. You know, Balaam said, forgive me for I have sinned. Pharaoh said, I have sinned. Judas Iscariot said, I have sinned. All three of those guys are in hell. You can say, I have sinned till the cows come home. Without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, God has no basis by which to forgive you of those sins. Redemption and forgiveness are connected because you can only be forgiven based on the redemption 
that's in the blood, the power of redemption in the blood. All right, now let's, let's finish it up with this. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1, and I touched on this last week when we dealt with predestination and adoption. Ephesians chapter number 1. There are two parts of redemption. And you can really kind of think of it as far as Israel goes in some sense, because here's Israel, they get redeemed on Passover night. The blood's put up there. Remember the death angel was coming through? And he said, hey, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word pass over comes from. They put the blood up there. Okay? So that is their redemption right there. However, they're not out of Egypt yet. They get up the next day and they start trekking and going out. And then they got across the Red Sea and so forth. There are two stages of your redemption. Um, we, are, we are redeemed right now. I'm redeemed. We should have sang redeemed. I would love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm redeemed right now, but yet I'm not redeemed. Because I'm still in Egypt. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, you ever look around? Uh, we're in Egypt. <laughs> All the stuff going on. We're in Egypt. But we're redeemed. There's two parts of your redemption. Notice Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood to forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Thank God we've got that right now. We've got God's forgiveness. But when you keep reading in the passage, come down if you will to verse number 13 and 14. Actually just go to verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Unto the praise of His glory. And I gave you the verses in Romans last week, so we won't look at it. There's a purchase that took place. God, He didn't have to purchase it on credit. He purchased you with His blood, but yet He hadn't taken His purchase home yet. We're still down here in Egypt. Another good illustration of this is Joseph. Remember when he died? Joseph said, look, he was the big guy over Egypt. He was second to Pharaoh on the throne. And Joseph was in control of all these things in Egypt. He said, look, I'm going to die and you're going to have to embalm me and all that. He goes, but when you leave, I know God's promised. He gave a promise to Abraham after 400 and something years to pull you out of here and take you into the promised land. When he does that, don't leave my bones here. Take them out with you. And you know when you read about Joshua and them coming in, they, they bring those bones with them. And so... He's purchased us. We're in Egypt, but there's coming a day there's going to be a big exodus. And I'm going up, and you're going up. The dead in Christ will rise first. The incorruptible will put on incorru uh, the incorruption will put on uh, corruption will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immort immortality. And the saying will be brought to pass. Death is swallowed up into victory. So our souls have been redeemed once we got saved. Our bodies will be redeemed at the rapture of the church. So that's a brief encapsulation of the doctrine here in Ephesians 1 verse 7 of redemption. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let me clarify one thing real quick. I gave you that reference in Colossians 1 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The new versions take through His blood out. If you remove through His blood the way that verse reads, in whom we have redemption even the forgiveness of sins. It makes redemption and forgiveness of sins the same. They're connected, but they're not the same. Because Israel was forgiven in the Old Testament, but yet they were not redeemed. So I think you can kind of see the reason that you need to stay with your King James Bible. Because it's accurate, and it's going to give the emphasis on the blood of Jesus Christ that pays the price for our redemption. Thank God for the blood. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the text. Thank you for this great book of Ephesians. Lord, help us to grasp these truths, basic truths, fundamental truths. But Lord, many of these doctrines we need to really nail down in our hearts and lives. Lord, help us to rejoice in our salvation. Thank you, Lord. One day you are going to redeem us out of this old world. Until then, Lord, help us to rejoice in what you have done. Thank you for forgiving us for loving us. Thank you for the blood that cleanses us and covers us from our sins. We love you now. I pray you might go with us. In Jesus' name, amen.